sponsors for today's program are Ryder and Auto Research Center. We have some uh, very distinguished guests on the program and we will talk to them uh, a little bit later about global freight issues and we'll delve into the world of intermodal transportation a little bit. We invite you to participate in the conversation by submitting uh, your question or comment to share at ttnews.com or simply use the comment box uh, on this article page on your computer. Before we begin, I want to take just a few minutes to talk about the top 50 global freight carriers list, which will be published in next week's edition of Transport Topics. You can see the list right now also by clicking on a link that you'll see on the lower part of this article page. This is a listing of the largest truck, rail, air, and ocean carriers in the world, in which companies are ranked on the basis of global freight revenue. This list is different from other transport topics lists in several respects. The most important distinction is that these companies represent all modes of transportation. And this makes it possible to see, really for the first time, how truck and rail freight carriers stack up against each other and against ocean and air cargo carriers. The list contains some familiar names, uh, UPS Inc. and FedEx Corp, unsurprisingly, are ranked number one and number two. These companies have long been at the forefront of global expansion, and so it's no surprise to see them at the top of this list as well. But there are also some unfamiliar names on the top 50 global freight carriers list, such as China Railway and the National Railroad of Ukraine. U.S. trucking companies are also represented on this list, but not as many as you might think. Only five, in fact, made the list. Um, J.B. Hunt Transport Services is the largest at number 32, and it's followed by YRC Worldwide, Conway Inc., Swift Transportation, and Schneider. Something else that you may find surprising, the companies on the top 50 global freight carriers list generated $600 billion in annual revenue from freight operations and more than $1 trillion in total revenue for, for 2014. And remember, we're largest companies, which represent a fraction of the total market for freight transportation globally. One of the things that I like about this list <clears throat> is that it provides us an opportunity to look more closely at the way freight is exchanged between the different modes of transportation. So much of the freight available to haul in the United States, or really any country in the world, comes from somewhere else. The World Trade Organization estimates that worldwide exports of merchandise alone was valued at $18.3 trillion in 2013. Exports of manufactured products was valued at $11.8 trillion. All of these goods, of course, must go through several transport modes to get where they're going. <coughs> Domestically, in the United States, we also see a shift in freight hauling from truck to rail, and sometimes from rail back to truck. We see goods move from air to ocean, and from ocean to air, depending on the urgency and the value of shipments. Freight is going both ways, and these intermodal connections are now the focus of much attention in the industry. And we see evidence that all of the participants in the supply chain, from shippers to carriers to third-party logistics companies, looking at how they can make the process of exchanging freight more efficient. To me, this represents a sea change in attitude and creates many new opportunities for freight carriers to provide shippers with more cost-effective service. Now, before we, uh, before we continue with the introduction of our special guests, I want to uh, share with the audience part of an interview I did with Michael Scheid. He's a senior analyst at SJ Consulting Group, and he helped us uh, develop this list. 
And in this segment, you, he will, you will hear him explain how the top 50 uh, global freight carriers list was put together. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, uh, how the list was compiled uh, and uh, what you may have learned uh, from doing this project. Sure. So uh, when we set out to do this list, we were looking to uh, create a list that has uh, never existed uh, or never been made available to the to the public. Um, we put together various lists on uh, companies in the top trucking segments like LTL truckload, as well as a global logistics list and even a, a list of the global transportation service providers. But we have never done one that focuses only on companies that own their assets. So the companies that own their trucks, trains, ships, and airplanes. So what we did is uh, we, we, we did a lot of research on the largest companies in the transportation space, figured out how much revenue they have from uh, the assets that they own, and uh, used that to build the list. Mm -hmm. um, something interesting that I learned from the list is the large extent to which railroads still play in uh, global transportation. Uh, if you look at the U.S., the uh, rail market comprises about 10 of domestic U.S. transportation revenues, but uh, within the list, the railroads were the largest segment by far, and they accounted for $200 billion, or about a third of the $600 billion in revenues on the list. Which may tell you something about the state of infrastructure development uh, uh, elsewhere in the world. The yeah, United absolutely. States. Yeah, yeah. it seems yeah. like uh, rail is, more big, uh, is a bigger focus than, you know, even trucking, where uh, these companies have more established uh, infrastructure. Sure. Uh, one of the things that surprised me, uh, uh, Michael, was the number of state-owned companies on the list. Um, I counted 12, including railroads uh, in China, Russia, even Germany, uh, and an air freight carrier even. Um, what can you tell us about the, the freight hauling capabilities of these companies, and are they comparable to, uh, to private commercial carriers? Sure. Well, there are some of the uh, state-owned companies uh, operate market monopolies like the Russian railways, the Chinese railways. So they have the, the ability to set their own service and rates. But some of the other state-owned companies actually compete in the private market. Uh, Deutsche Bahn owns, owns DB Schenker, the big logistics company. Uh, Emirates, the uh, airline based in UAE, they operate a cargo division with, which competes against other cargo airlines. In the uh, uh, state-owned Chinese container ship lines, they uh, they compete against privately and publicly owned container ship lines. So these companies really have to, you know, make sure that they're adequate with price and service in order to be able to win customers' business. We'll hear more from Michael later in the show, and uh, the full interview with Michael uh, is also available online. Uh, at the conclusion of this this program, so I'd like to remind viewers uh, that you can uh, participate in today's show by emailing your comments or questions to share at ttnews.com, or by entering your question or comment directly on this articles page on your computer. So we are joined uh, on on the set with um, a couple experts from the industry. Um, uh, one is uh, Mark Holden. He is C, uh, CEO of a &R Logistics in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, Morning, he's man. at the far left. And also Jim Hertwig. He is Chief Executive Officer of Florida East Coast Railway in Jacksonville, Florida. Morning, Dan. Welcome. Thank you. Later in the program, we'll be joined by Curtis Whalen. He is Executive Director of the Intermodal Motor Carriers Conference of American Trucking Associations, and Rip Watson, Senior Reporter for Transport Topics. And we'll talk with them uh, in more detail about some of the issues confronting port operators and uh, drayage companies. Thank you once again, gentlemen, for taking time to participate in this program. And I'd like to begin uh, by asking each of you to comment on the idea that um, we have moved past a period of confrontation between the modes and entering what some might call uh, a golden age of intermodal transportation. Um, do you see evidence in your own businesses that suggest shippers are taking more advantage of multimodal transportation services? Jim, do you want to begin? Sure. We uh, certainly see that. Uh, we work with the ocean carriers and obviously all the truckers. 
uh, with 78% of our business being intermodal, the uh, majority of that freight gets either picked up or delivered with a trucker. And uh, we've seen uh, a good solid growth, uh, continued conversion from uh, over the road uh, to intermodal. So it's been a, a real good market for us. And uh, Mark, what is your perspective? Do you see uh, a change? In I, I do, Dan. I think uh, uh, we part, at a &R Logistics, we participate in the uh, bulk transportation uh, uh, over the highway. And one of the primary uh, commodities we transport is plastic resin. We're in this country in the very early stages of a significant increase in the uh, uh, production of plastic resin, which is beginning to uh, dictate uh, new uh, su uh, supply channels and uh, as a result we're working with uh, our customers uh, and the railroads in, uh, mm -hmm. in the design of the uh, supply chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah we'll talk a little bit more about that project that uh, you're working on uh, to handle plastic resins a little bit later. That's very interesting. Um, but again both of you, um, do you see shippers um, 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 doing more um, uh, with multimodal transportation. Are they driving this? Is it something that uh, um, you see the carriers uh, offering better services? Is that part of why, why we're seeing a, a, an increase in intermodal? Well, from my perspective, I think uh, we see a lot of that from the customers. Uh, obviously, moving product intermodal is uh, greener. It's better for the environment. And I think a lot of them are looking at that today. Uh, in addition to, uh, if you look at the intermodal services today, they're very comparable to the over-the-road truck in uh, some uh, major markets. And uh, in fact, we do a lot of business with truckload carriers uh, who actually put their trailers on our railroad and uh, we run them from Jacksonville down to Miami and bring them back to them. Uh, obviously, it's an advantage to them because there's not a lot of freight coming out of Miami uh, at this time and it uh, reduces their uh, empty miles and improves their productivity. So it's a win-win for uh, the truckers and for the railroad. But it hasn't always been like this, has it? Uh, there used to be, you know, much a lot of friction between rail and truck, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's, do you still see that well, a little bit? I don't see gone? that nearly like it was before. Uh, we really partner with the uh, majority of all the truckload carriers okay. and LTLs. Okay, well that's good, all right. You know, in my reporting on this issue, um, um, I, I, I talked with um, uh, Tom Finkbinder, who's involved with, a, I think, a very interesting startup uh, company called mm -hmm. Tiger Cool Express. Um, it's based in Overland Park, and um, they use inter refrigerated intermodal containers to haul produce from the West Coast to the Midwest and Northeast uh, for grocers and uh, wholesalers. It was, uh, Tom, it was interesting to hear Tom say that he had sh shopped this idea uh, with at least 80 different um, investors uh, before he found one that uh, was willing to <coughs> put the money to help him create this uh, um, uh, network of, of, of intermodal containers, uh, which he did. It started up in 2013, and uh, now the company's on track to generate about $100 million in annual revenue and has a fleet of 700 and 30 containers. Um, um, this to me is a, a good example of, of the opportunity that is available uh, in, in intermodal and, mm -hmm. um, and innovation that we're starting to see. So I think we'll, we'll see more of that as time goes by. Now, of course, what's, what's in the best interest of one mode it, uh, may not always be in the best interest of another. A good example of that is, is what we're seeing on the ocean carrier side in which um, Ocean carriers are buying bigger ships to haul more containers to, in order to maximize that line haul, that uh, route uh, over the ocean. Uh, but that's creating problems at the ports uh, where we're getting uh, m bigger peaks of volume uh, of containers uh, coming in at one time. You know, the head of the New York uh, Shipping Association put it to me this way. He said, uh, imagine an airliner full of passengers arriving just moments before touchdown. Um, that's what happens when a container ship pulls into port with thousands of shipments that need to be hauled to hundreds of different destinations for scores of different customers. Uh, if you don't have a good handle on, 
on where that freight needs to go, uh, you've got a real uh, problem. Uh, yeah. it's, it's chaos. And so I know a lot of people are working on this problem and trying to improve the flow of information and move containers in and out of the ports uh, at a greater speed. So um, uh, hopefully we'll see some improvement there. Um, as I said earlier, I'd like to, to, to talk in more detail with you, Mark, about a project that you've worked on with Union Pacific Railroad in Dallas. It's called Flexport. And this is a facility that will handle plastic resins from some of the new factories that we're seeing built along the U.S. Gulf Coast in response to lower natural gas prices, mm -hmm. as I understand it. Uh, tell us more about this facility and how this partnership with UP came about. Sure, Dan, be glad to. Yeah, you touched on it. Really, the, uh, what's prompting uh, the opportunity is the uh, uh, development of fracking in the United States and, and uh, natural gas, cheap natural gas, which is, uh, will be used to produce more plastic resin in uh, the United States. In fact, today there's, I believe, over $50 billion of uh, new investment uh, constructing and building uh, new production facilities for plastic resin. Uh, that rep will represent over a 50% increase in uh, uh, production of resin in the United States. Most of that will be destined for export. Uh, and as a result, we're seeing early signs that uh, export of plastic resin in, in the United States will more than triple to over $20 billion of, uh, of export resin. And so uh, working uh, with the Uni uh, Union Pacific, Union Pacific is the largest carrier of plastic resin by rail mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. A&R Logistics is the largest carrier of plastic resin by truck okay. in the United States. And we share many of the same customers. And so it, it uh, makes a lot of sense for us uh, given uh, the uh, production that's coming online uh, to both uh, work together and collaborate uh, for the benefit of mutual customers. Uh, I know this facility isn't open yet, but what will it look like? And can you talk about the process of handling this material and, and is it moving by truck or by rail? Well, uh, uh, that's a good question as far as ultimately what it will look like. We're still trying to uh, figure that out based on, um, again, a lot of uncertainty as far as uh, when the new plant's coming online, uh, how much they will produce, how much of the resin will be consumed domestically, and how much ultimately will get exported. And of that that gets exported, how much will go to Asia, how much will go to South America. And so there's a lot of, of uh, uncertainty today uh, still, even though we're only a few years away, uh, from uh, really knowing what uh, the facility and the operation uh, will look like. But uh, we know enough that uh, in working with the Union Pacific uh, that ultimately it will uh, move initially from the point of production uh, by rail into uh, our facility uh, in Dallas, which will be adjacent to uh, the uh, Dallas uh, Intermodal Terminal uh, that uh, the UP operates. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, uh, the, you'll um, package the uh, resin into smaller quantities. It'll go back on the rail for some of it anyway, for transport to the West Coast and ultimately to customers in Asia. Am I right? Yes, yes, correct. In fact, uh, uh, we have a natural advantage in Dallas uh, with um, the number of empty container boxes. And so there's uh, the availability of container boxes in Dallas, uh, which are much greater than, say, in Houston. And so the supply of uh, the intermodal box or the container box is a big factor in terms of looking at uh, moving a resin into Dallas first, packaging it, uh, and, and then we will dray it onto uh, uh, the rail car uh, which then it will move to the West Coast. But ultimately, uh, by working together with the Union Pacific and collaborating on really what uh, we call a blank sheet of paper, is we believe we'll be able to design a supply chain for the export of plastic resin, which is safer, it's faster, and it's low cost. Mm -hmm. 
and and uh, we believe that uh, uh, that will uh, obviously benefit our customers, uh, and uh, as a result, uh, we will uh, continue to uh, gain more business. Okay, great. Thanks for the explanation. I I want to take a minute to uh, um, say that. Uh, uh, Doug Craven, who is a, an executive at UP, who we invited to participate in the program to also talk about this a little bit. And he was unable to come today because of a death in the family. So our condolences uh, go out to Doug, uh, and we certainly understand uh, that. Um, uh, I think what you've described is a, is a great example of, of kind of what we're going to see more of in the future, with, uh, especially with the U.S. Uh, becoming more competitive in the market. Uh, in the world market for manufactured goods and, and certain commodities uh, like the ones you're talking about. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it occurs to me that uh, if you look back in time at some of the uh, biggest exports from the U.S., it was scrap iron and, mm -hmm. uh, and waste products, right? Yes. Um, I think we may, may be on the cusp of a, a change finally where we're exporting more valuable goods and uh, there's, a, there's obviously a role to play for um, for all modes uh, to get this. Well, it's, it's, uh, I would add then to that point, it's interesting that the U.S. is actually going from a net importer of plastic resin now to a net exporter I see. of resin because yeah. of net gas. And so your point's very valid. And we'll likely see maybe the same thing occur with refined fuels, uh, petroleum. Um, we're, how many people would have guessed that we would be at this point where we're almost energy self-sufficient? But uh, th th this is you know, represents a big change. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, Jim, I want to turn to you because your company is also involved <coughs> in some very interesting projects, including uh, the development of a inland container transfer facility uh, at sure. Port Everglades. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and there's some in infrastructure improvements, that I understand, at the Port of Miami that I think uh, will have you believe anyway will have a, an impact on the, the volume of goods moving through that facility. Uh, can you talk a little bit about sure. both of those uh, projects? Sure, they're uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, at Port Everglades, it's $73 million, of which we put in $35 million, uh, and uh, the state put in $18 million, and uh, Broward County put in 20. Mm. And uh, we moved from a 12-acre intermodal facility to a 43-acre facility. Uh, that uh, we can handle up over 600,000 lifts on an annualized basis. And at that particular port, we've seen over 20% growth since we opened it in July of last year. Uh, down in Port Miami, that was another uh, public-private partnership uh, where we uh, restored the on-dock rail onto the port. And that was about $50 million, of which our portion was about 10. The federal government put in 23 and uh, Miami-Dade County put in five, and the state put in nine million dollars. So really working together. Today we're running trains every day uh, out of uh, Port Miami. Uh, in addition, at Port Miami, uh, in fact, Friday I'll be going to a uh, ribbon-cutting ceremony. They'll have the 50-foot of dredge complete. So Panama Canal will be expanded next year in April, and there will be three ports on the East Coast that will be able to take the big ships, and that will be Miami and also uh, Norfolk and Baltimore. So uh, we uh, fill a lot of that traffic uh, will come on our railroad. We service the southeast in two days and overnight the state of Florida and actually can reach 70% of the population in less than four days. Could you talk a little bit more about the intermodal facility? Um, what happens at this facility, and how is it different from handling the, the sure. containers at the port itself? The, the, the Port Everglades facility uh, there is rather different in that we have two gates. We have a back gate uh, where all the product from the port comes through all the portals uh, that's required and, and comes into the facility. And then in the northern gate is where we put domestic freight that comes in. So as an example, uh, if we had a uh, domestic customer with a shipment going to Charlotte, uh, they would bring it in and we would load the 53-footer with a 40-foot marine container also going to Charlotte and build those trains directly out of that particular facility. I see. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing maybe a pattern here of, of, of construction of more in, inland uh, container handling facilities. Can you explain a little bit about the rationale for that? Why, what, how does this help the intermodal freight transportation process to have these uh, 
I think a lot of times when you can do it and you can mix both the domestic and the international together uh, at one particular facility, uh, you're able to build uh, direct trains out of there because you're doubling up on your densities basically by taking the international with the domestic and putting them together so you can load to a lot more points uh, direct, which is you know, certainly a key to improving service. Yeah. You mentioned that you have a lot of truckers that you are, are bringing freight to the railroads. Mm -hmm. Now, are they, uh, is this freight that is transferred into containers by and large, or is no. it piggyback? Oh. Are trailers being loaded onto trailers still? Yeah, it's uh, trailers on flat car, and that's a okay. big part of our business, Dan. Yeah. Uh, as I said, uh, a lot of the truckers don't want to go into the South Florida because there's not a lot of freight coming out of there. And uh, what's happened for them is they're able to bring that trader into our facility in Jacksonville, and we lift it onto our rail cars, take it down there, and then we deliver it actually with our trucking operations uh, for the truckload carrier and then put it back on the rail and bring it back empty. Uh, that way the uh, driver for the uh, truckload carrier can just come into Jacksonville, drop the load, pick up an empty, and then make their next pickup. So it's, it improves the uh, efficiency of drivers. And as we know today, uh, with the driver shortage out there and driver shortage to come in the future, uh, that's very important to a lot of our uh, truckload partners. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. You know, I mentioned earlier that it w what was good for one mode uh, isn't necessarily good for another. And right now we're seeing um, dramatically lower fuel prices uh, throughout the industry. Um, Jim, how, how will this affect uh, the ability of railroads to continue converting over-the-road freight to rail, if, if any? Well, it, it does. Uh, I think if you take a look at the statistics, uh, history shows uh, as fuel goes up, certainly a lot more freight moves intermodally than uh, over the road. I think it to a lesser degree than what we've seen in the past. And the primary reason for that is I think uh, a lot of the truckload carriers will tell you it's very difficult to, you may have trucks available, but you can't find drivers to drive those trucks. And that's been something that the, the carriers have worked very hard to try to do. But uh, again, the railroad allows them that opportunity to put a lot of their excess capacity onto the rail where it fits uh, their networks. And, in, and mm -hmm. what we've always noticed is when the fuel rates go up, uh, the truckers are less likely to deadhead to make a pickup. Uh, I always like to call it precision dispatch because when they make a pickup and they know that driver is going to a suburb of Atlanta, they're looking for a load in that suburb of Atlanta mm -hmm. to get that truck loaded back out. When fuel goes down, they're not as concerned with short haul empty miles mm -hmm. as they were before. And I think that's a kind of a big difference uh, in, the, in the whole market. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Mark, would you like to chime in? Uh, you know, fuel is obviously something uh, important to your trucking operation. Uh, how has it affected your business? And do you see sure, Dan. We, uh, you know, and actually interestingly in a couple of ways. One, with uh, uh, volatile uh, crude prices and, and fluctuating uh, fuel prices. We, uh, most trucking companies today have a, a fuel surcharge built into their contracts, and so they, they escalate up or down, and, and they'll move uh, with the same direction that the fuel moves. And so uh, today, truckers are, I would say, better insulated uh, against uh, volatile fuel. Uh, certainly, as fuel goes down, uh, it, it makes it more competitive uh, for truck. Uh, however, uh, again, uh, driver shortage is real in this country and uh, is uh, not going to get uh, uh, any better anytime soon. Uh, specifically to uh, plastic resin, uh, resin uh, is uh, uh, prices move uh, uh, directly uh, in step with crude prices. And so as crude goes down, resin prices go down. And so uh, as a result, consumers, buyers of resin, uh, will tend to then wait for prices to continue to drop before they buy more inventory. So we see it on both sides, both as uh, a, a, an expense uh, a fuel that we uh, burn in our tractors, but also on the demand side, on, the, on our top line, we see uh, volatile crude prices affecting uh, the uh, demand for uh, resin. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about your ability to keep up on the truck side with hiring drivers and, and 
providing the capacity uh, and on that side? Well, I think uh, we're in a very good position. Uh, because of the nature of our business, uh, our length of haul is much shorter than the typical industry. Our length of haul is less than 200 miles. Uh, the industry, as you uh, know, Dan, is probably closer to 500 miles. And so uh, length of haul is a big deal. Drivers get home more often. Uh, we also generally uh, pay uh, greater than uh, the typical over the road because uh, our drivers uh, uh, are asked to do more uh, in terms of loading and unloading of uh, uh, plastic resin. And so they're, uh, they're home more uh, and uh, they get paid more. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, our turnover uh, from a, a driver perspective it runs uh, less than half of the industry norm. So our turnover of drivers will run less than 50%. Whereas the industry, as you know, Dan, runs closer to 100%. Yeah. yeah it, it sounds like the, the industry is moving in your direction. Um, you know, it is more difficult to maintain long-haul service. Um, it's more difficult to find drivers willing to stay on the road for long periods of time. So, yeah, I think everyone's looking for a regional solution yes. to, to the problem. And rail's part of it, as you said, Jim. Um, let's go back to the question of the Panama Canal. Um, um, uh, and the impact that it's going to have on freight flows in North America. Um, would you care to offer some more insight as to what, we, sure. what we're going to see in terms of volume and the impact on ports? Right. There's a lot of people that have a lot of different views on this. Obviously, Dan, uh, I'll give you my view. Uh, certainly with uh, Port Miami having the 50 foot of water, you know, I'm very excited about that as an opportunity. Uh, I think what we're going to see uh, is uh, customers are always going to want to see what uh, the price is. And when you're running uh, the containers all the way to the East Coast now on the big vessels coming through the Panama Canal, it makes that very competitive. So I think what you'll initially see is somewhat of a, a, a change in some of the destination ports along the East Coast to where some of the small, the ones that can't take the big ships, that cargo will go to either Miami, Norfolk, or Baltimore. Uh, from the West Coast uh, perspective, you know, certainly with some of the goods that come through there, high value goods, I think they're gonna continue to move through the West Coast. Uh, but when you start getting into the low value goods where they're looking for the transportation price, I think you'll see some of that traffic possibly move through the Panama Canal onto the East Coast. And certainly since the labor disruptions this past year, uh, a lot of that freight has transitioned uh, to the East Coast. It has. We're already seeing that impact. Yes. Mm. Uh, so you think a lot of more freight is going to come into primarily three ports. I wonder how the people in New York, New Jersey feel about that. Uh, I know there's some infrastructure <laughs> improvements going on there to well, capture some of this freight as well, right? Well, yeah, let me qualify that. There's mm. still going to be a lot of vessels in the market that can take uh, you know, they're, they're not going to be all huge uh, 13,000 TE vessels uh, coming through. Uh, but those that do move on the large vessels coming through the Panama Canal will only be able to call those three ports. Okay. Um, to one more question about that then. I'm just curious, <clears throat> what's going to happen to that freight once it gets uh, on land? If, if we're seeing large vo larger mm -hmm. volumes of containers mm -hmm. coming in, and landing at these three ports. Are we going to see more you know, trucking uh, of some of that freight to other destinations once it gets on board? Will we see actually, um, I've, I've, I've heard somebody, some people describe the idea of putting them on smaller ships and transporting them from Miami to New York, let's say, or Boston, or you know, sort of a short sea shipping, sort of a LTL model for ocean carriers developing because of these large ships. Is, do you see that? Well, my perspective on that is if you take a look at Florida, and I don't know if you're aware of this, Dan, but now Florida is the third most populous uh, state in the country, okay. uh, moving ahead of New York and only behind Texas and California. So there's a lot of population there and also 90 million people visit the great state of Florida. So it's a consuming state. So a lot of that freight that comes into Port Miami will be destined to the state of Florida, where we serve over overnight market there. Okay. Uh, I think you'll also see traffic into the southeast, where we can deliver that in two days from South Florida 
uh, that freight will continue to move through Miami and into the southeast. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, great. Well, let's, let's take a moment to uh, remind viewers that uh, you can participate in the program, uh, again, by emailing your comments or questions to share at ttnews.com. And uh, we're looking for your comments now, so. Uh, um, let's talk about um, mergers and acquisitions involving <laughs> large companies. We've seen a, a few recently, um, and, uh, and, and some of those include um, the purchase of Toll Group in Australia by Japan Post, right? Uh, APL Logistics was sold to a Korean transport company. Um, FedEx is trying to buy a European company, TNT Express, right, to expand its package business over there. Just last week, um, we reported on, the tr on <coughs> a deal between XPO Logistics and um, Conway. Conway, of course, is on our list of top 50 global freight carriers. And um, XPO has previously um, uh, acquired the Norbert Dent Strangle in France, which is a big freight carrier in Europe. They already own uh, a couple warehousing and distribution companies here. They bought Pacer International, which was a big uh, intermodal uh, carrier, and Bridge Terminal Transport, which is a drage, a major drage company. So, um, so we're seeing a lot of activity in this space. Um, Wondering if, if, you, if both of you could comment a little on, on how this might change the way shippers access freight services. Do you see uh, these large companies having um, a bigger role to play in determining who gets the freight? Well, I, we do business with all the XPO companies, so uh, uh, I think uh, what we see happening really out of that is as these networks that they uh, purchase is uh, with the sophistication in computer modeling today, uh, they're able to match up freight that uh, heretofore would be moving, maybe there's a backhaul moving that could fill a headhaul movement. And in the companies before, they never even considered that. Well, I think what we will find is a lot of times that somebody like XPO will be able to balance their networks a whole lot better having uh, access to this big market of freight. And then where they're not balanced, they'll go out and put their salespeople on finding that balance. And you know, and the key in the business is to be able to balance your networks. Mm. Mark? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I, uh, uh, I guess from my perspective, Dana, uh, uh, one thing we can count on that's change. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's constant and, and uh, lots of uh, uh, dynamics uh, in, in any business. Uh, certainly volatility and, and crude uh, creates uh, changing dynamics. Uh, just the, the demographics within the trucking industry with the driver. You know, it, uh, the uh, driver population is, is growing older, and so uh, the uh, driver pool is uh, becoming uh, smaller. And so uh, as a carrier or as a shipper, uh, having control over the capacity today uh, is, a gr is more, becoming more of a priority. Uh, we see it uh, both in terms of a shrinking supply of drivers and an increasing uh, 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 production of product. Uh, those uh, are uh, two trends which uh, we see uh, shippers becoming uh, increasingly concerned about their supply chain. And so uh, I think as a result of that, um, uh, many times uh, that will stimulate uh, uh, merger ac uh, acquisition activity. We, uh, we bought A&R Logistics uh, just a little over two years ago uh, because we could see the same thing. Uh, that uh, shippers and we felt like that was an opportunity for us uh, to enter the, uh, this field and make additional uh, acquisitions uh, within the bulk transportation space. Mm -hmm. Is there anything about this trend that bothers you? For instance, I think a lot, some people are concerned about the combination of some ocean carriers. Uh, uh, is that something that might affect your business, uh, Jim, you think? Or? Uh, I don't see, I mean, I think when they do, uh, you see uh, things like that happen. I think the biggest thing is the integration and the uh, 
the, the systems and what they can uh, provide as far as uh, technology to their customers to better build their shipments, more timely information uh, as it moves through there. And I think that's some of the benefits that they get out of there along with just additional uh, freight density to fill up the ships. Yeah, indeed. You know, probably um, what I hear most from people when I talk to them about intermodal is the, the desire for consistent service, right? This seems to be the key to getting uh, uh, more intermodal freight. Um, and in the past couple of years, uh, we've had some problems in this area um, with the weather, um, with uh, capacity uh, uh, for the rails. Um, Jim, can you tell us uh, uh, what's being done what has been done and maybe what can, yeah. we can still expect in the future in terms of improving and, and making more reliable the rail service that intermodal depends upon. I think you're seeing billions of dollars invested on the part of the railroads uh, to double track their networks uh, to pre uh, prevent this congestion, the building of new intermodal f hubs uh, around the country. And, and this is really helping improve the service. And for the most part, we've seen service come back uh, to, to a solid level at this point in time with them. What's a solid level? <laughs> uh, consistent where better it was. Better than ever? Or not better, better than ever. Uh, yeah. You know, very close to that. And again, you have different rails and different service levels at each ones. But overall, from an industry standpoint, the industry has gotten much better at service. And, uh, you know, it was a little bit of a rough year last year. But uh, they're back on, back on track today. Can it improve much more? Well, uh, and if so, how? well, one of the things that uh, we've been able to do, and I only speak for uh, our railroad, if you don't mind, uh, uh, what we do is we run multiple schedules. Uh, we run six trains south and six trains north every day. And what we found is that is an advantage uh, for us because sometimes in the intermodal networks, you may only have one or two trains going to this uh, between two of the common o origin and destination points in a day. By running multiple train starts, if you miss a cutoff, you have another train going in four to six hours. So I think that's one of the things in the future you'll see additional train starts where you don't, uh, you can make uh, the cutoffs and, uh, you know, if you're late for one, that doesn't mean it'll set for 12 or 24 hours. There'll be another one going in six hours. Yeah, sure. Now, it's, it's probably worth uh, mentioning that the biggest intermodal shipper in the country used to be UPS, and I presume it still is. Mm -hmm. uh, Right? Mm -hmm. um, 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 so UPS, once again, ranked number one on the top 50 global freight carriers list. You know, bigger is better in many respects. Um, uh, and I think even the big companies would, are, are finding that uh, getting even larger is an advantage. So, well, you know, you talk about infrastructure development, and, and certainly the railroads are spending money on improving their infrastructure. <coughs> We're seeing this abroad as well. Uh, in China, for example, the, they're rapidly developing their road and rail networks uh, in the interior in the hopes of developing more industry in those regions. Um, one of the things that I encountered in my reporting was uh, a new rail service uh, from China to Europe. Uh, this is something that uh, gives shippers an alternative to uh, ocean. It's, it's faster a little bit and uh, obviously cheaper than, than air cargo. So you're seeing these uh, very interesting unit trains uh, moving uh, parts, auto parts, electronics, mm -hmm. clothing, anything that, you, that China makes uh, is going by rail now uh, to, to Europe. So um, I want to uh, um, go back now to uh, another segment of my interview with Michael Scheib and uh, we'll hear him talk about uh, global trade and uh, some of the changes that he expects to see in the size and capabilities of global freight carriers. So, uh, another thing that's interesting, I think, for our readers uh, to see is the, how the, these companies break down by mode um, and where they're based. Obviously, um, uh, there are only five companies, as by my reckoning on the list that are sort of pure trekking companies and one of those, J.B. Hunt, is mostly an intermodal carrier, right? So we see um, rail and um, ocean transport as being much bigger uh, 
factors in the global prey market. Uh, uh, what, what else can you tell us, I guess, about uh, the modal um, breakdown of, of the companies on this list and, uh, and their uh, ability to compete uh, with each other? Sure. Yeah, I think I think the list really reflects uh, the global aspects of the uh, transportation and logistics industries because, I, like you said, there are more ocean carriers ranked on the list than uh, any other group of companies. There are 18 in total, um, and ocean is the dominant mode for moving goods between countries across oceans across borders, uh, as compared to only three air freight carriers. So it shows you that you know, the concentration of uh, moving goods uh, via ocean rather than via rail. Um, yeah, as you said, there are only five trucking companies on the list, including J.B. Hunt, which is mainly intermodal. And uh, despite the U.S. market being $700 billion for trucking, uh, these companies only represent $22 billion. So it shows you that trucking companies aren't as large globally. Um, they are large within the U.S., but that's not, uh, it's not as common to have such large asset-based trucking companies elsewhere in the globe. It was interesting also the, the the total freight revenue that you calculated for these 50 companies was over 600 billion dollars, uh, which is huge. Mm -hmm. and, and total revenue for these companies approaches one trillion dollars. Uh, uh, to me, that's uh, surprising. Uh, and um, um, yeah, do you know off the top of your head that you know how this compares to the size of the uh, the worldwide? Uh, uh, transportation marketplace? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the last time that I saw a number on the uh, worldwide transportation marketplace. I, I, you know, like you said, the uh, total revenues for these companies add up to a, a trillion. So uh, clearly the uh, the total market is above a trillion. I'd, uh, I, I think these companies can probably uh, hold maybe 25% um, to a third of the total uh, global transportation marketplace. I see. Welcome back. You're watching a special live on web program to discuss intermodal transportation and the top 50 global freight carriers uh, feature. Our program is sponsored today by Rider and Auto Research Center. Once again, I'd like to remind viewers that you can participate in today's program. Send your comments or questions to us at uh, share at ttnews.com or simply enter your comments directly on this articles page on your computer. We're joined now um, by uh, Rip Watson, who is a senior reporter at Transport Topics. And Rip, you've uh, spent most of your long career in journalism writing about railroads and intermodal transportation, so I'm pleased to have you join the panel uh, to talk with um, another expert. Um, would you... Uh, if you don't mind, please introduce. I'd be happy, uh, to. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Dan. Okay. It's an honor to be here. i um, be joined by these two uh, fine gentlemen. To my right is Curtis Whalen, who is the executive director of the American Trucking Association's Intermodal Motor Carriers Conference. Um, Curtis and Jim, uh, I'd like to take a little time here and just zero in real quickly on how you see the market right now during the peak season. How does how is the business volume shaping up? Well, we uh, had a, a great second quarter, but uh, since July, things have been quite soft. Uh, July and August, uh, we've not seen the peak that uh, we thought we might be seeing. Uh, however, in the last week, we have seen a small uptick in our volumes, but uh, it's been disappointing, Rip. Uh, Curtis, from, how about from the trucker side? I certainly agree with the observation of where it's been. I did see this morning when I was uh, reading my morning clips that we are now 100 days away from Christmas. And generally speaking, for the port trucking industry and everybody associated with it, that does mean we will be moving into uh, a, the peak season. And there are some definitions now that might be different than historically. But clearly, from what we know, we are going to see pretty steady increases. I guess that's the good news. The bad news from a trucking perspective is, is will we see the same kind of congestion issues that last year plagued us throughout that season? No. So. Let's, uh, we'll get back to that in a moment, but let's uh, zero in first on, do you think that the growth that we saw, like 23% increase in Long Beach and uh, similar increases in LA and Oakland in the August uh, loadings or something 
that we're going to see throughout the rest of the country. Perhaps we'll see a similar uptick on the East Coast as well in August, September. I, I think we'll see some upticks. I don't think we'll see anything as dramatic as those numbers. I mean, right now we're still in flux to get back to congestion. A lot of people are still hedging their bets on where they want their product uh, to be in a month or two as they look at the Christmas selling season. So uh, the, the industry is quite uh, flexible on making decisions about I'm going to go here, not there. Uh, we talk about diversions all the time from the West Coast to the East Coast. There certainly have been some that one would hope might continue if you're an East Coaster, but on the other hand, the numbers you cited showed that that diversion must have flipped and gone back the other way for whatever else that the number made up. So I think we're still, it's pretty hard to predict too far out where it's going to be, and I think people are still watching to see what the performance looks like. Um, Jim, how about from your perspective? Well, I think uh, a little bit of difference is uh, some of the shippers last year uh, in advance of the labor uh, getting the labor settled, uh, started diverting shipments earlier on last year to the East Coast. So the comps on the East Coast this year will be a little harder than they were last year, whereas on the West Coast they'll be a lot easier. So uh, we'll watch all this play out. Okay. Um, you've, we've got a perfect segue here to uh, what I think is a fascinating subject, which is how all of these changes in the volumes that are running through the ports, uh, which is higher overall, even though there was some shift in activity, uh, are actually occurring and changing the way that the ports themselves operate. Uh, could you both speak a little bit about uh, chassis pools and how much they have helped or how much they might have hurt um, the operations in the ports? Well, certainly on paper, chassis pools are generally a very good thing for all those involved in the transportation of containers and such. It gives you the ability to better manage the equipment that's very integral to the whole process. Uh, it makes it easier for the trucker who can pick up a single chassis and use it for multiple runs each day, which is different than the old model. Uh, the problem, however, from looking at it on paper and looking at it in the real sense is that over the last several years, uh, who owns that chassis, who's responsible for where it is and what condition is in, has changed dramatically. Historically, this was an ocean carrier piece of equipment. Uh, today, I guess well over 90% of all chassis are not owned by the ocean carrier. They're owned by private leasing companies, private ownership companies, some truckers, uh, but the vast majority are out of the traditional hand. So trying to then structure a chassis pool in the general sense as we know it is more difficult. You've got antitrust issues, you've got competitive issues. There's a lot of things that are going into well, this. We can get into <laughs> every one of those, but let's hear a little bit more about the, uh, the whole chassis pool perspective from Jim. But as far as chassis pool, certainly in a rail terminal, uh, we like the chassis pools. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, years ago, you would have to uh, go find the uh, MOL chassis or the CMA chassis and match it to the box. And it was uh, expensive in doing it. Uh, today, you're able to go in and to the chassis pool, put the box on one of the uh, pool chassis, and out the gate it goes. So, you know, from a railroad's perspective, at our at the facilities, it's an advantage. Yeah, and that's a great, it's a great thing. But you, you've raised an interesting point with the MOL chassis and the CMA chassis. Uh, Fred Joring, who is the president of a trucking company in Southern California, pointed out to us recently that when a ship arrives in uh, Long Beach or LA, uh, instead of having six container stacks to have to uh, go to, now there are 33 different combinations. Uh, when a, sh a ship comes in with five or six carriers, uh, ship uh, loads on the on the vessel, and uh, even though there is a chassis pool now in Southern California, uh, we still have this uh, complicated matter of sorting out the freight and moving it out of the terminal from the trucker standpoint. Um, do you think this kind of uh, these global alliances? are making the job tougher for truckers? 
I certainly think in the short term they have been. I mean, one of the things that has come out over the years, people have discussed these issues, is those larger ships and the alliances, obviously because of the, the economics that they're trying to put together, uh, those ships will come in with a far less uh, defined load. It will be spread out among many, many uh, or shippers on that side. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, those stacks, as you described, are not particularly consolidated, where the same group of truckers could go in, pick it up, and, and get out of there. And so there is a, a new requirement, if you want to try to improve the efficiencies, to consolidate that stack. And it may be here and somewhere else down the wharf. That takes time. Those are extra yeah. moves that weren't there before. So, yeah. so Jim, you've got a trucking company. Um, this, the, some of the alliances call in South Florida ports mm -hmm. where you operate. Um, how much of a complication has that been? Well, I, I just want to really uh, talk a little bit about that. I think it's more uh, a carrier uh, specific. When you have a carrier coming in that's part of an alliance and they have their own terminal operations, well, think about it. All the other uh, carriers on that ship, uh, their containers coming in there, it gets unloaded, put on a chassis it leaves that particular terminal. Now when it comes back, it's not going to come back to that terminal in most likelihood. It's going to return to wherever that carrier's terminal facility is uh, out there. So I think a lot of it is uh, just issues with uh, the vessel sharing or the alliances as you called it. And that creates a difficult difficulty everywhere. Okay. And I think that's something that as an industry uh, we're going to have to solve. Well. Um this is a perfect segue into one of our favorite subjects, which is the chassis that are so central to the entire uh, operation of inland transportation. Um, I'd like to start, uh, Jim, with you, since you've owned some chassis. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can tell me, tell us a little bit about why you got into them and how that's worked out. We got into the chassis uh, predominantly in our Jacksonville operation. And the reason for that rip was uh, we do a lot of what I call regional trucking. And when you're doing regional trucking, you want to make sure you've got a good chassis, uh, well maintained, if you're going to be going out 250 miles to deliver a, a load and then pick up a load and come back. So we did it more because of our scope out of our Jacksonville facility and running our trucks uh, 250 miles out there. Uh, and wanting to have our own chassis and be under control of our own chassis in that market. Um, Curtis, you're uh, part of a, you know, or associated with an organization that has become a chassis owner too, you know, through the NACPAC as it's called. Uh, can you tell me a little bit from the trucker's perspective about the value of chassis ownership? Well, it, it was a difficult decision to do that, but as the business model changed, uh, our analysis showed that if you wanted to, as either individual truckers or groups of truckers, have some control or input into what the, the aspects of this new model were going to be, you had to have uh, skin in the game. Uh, so I had members that did pool their resources. We got federal approval to set up one. And uh, so now, for very much the same reasons that were described, uh, the best way to be able to manage that very important resource and to make sure you not only have the equipment where it is, but it is in good shape, is to own it yourself. Uh, but that is not an option that many truckers can, can afford to and, do. And why not? Well, again, it's, it's, a, it's a costly business. You have each chassis, depending upon its age, you can figure a new chassis runs you over 10,000 bucks. Uh, you have to maintain that chassis, and then your, your, how you move your chassis is not just up to you any longer. We've known from, obviously, you've covered these issues uh, where the unions are trying to enforce uh, maintenance and repair and inspection requirements on your equipment over which they have no legal authority to well, do. And that's that, that, if I'm a purchaser of a piece of equipment that may be out of my hands, I'm not sure I want to spend any of my own money on it. Well, and that's possibly something we could take <laughs> up in another live on web. There's a lot of complications there. Um, talk about uh, the chassis uh, ownership uh, when someone else is the owner and you are suddenly confronted with having to move that uh, use that chassis. Uh, are you satisfied with the condition of chassis that 
come to you, come into, that FEC may have to work with? Yeah, I mean, we'll, I'll speak just to FEC is, you know, our, our chassis pool is a track chassis pool. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work with them to make sure those chassis are well maintained. If not, we have rotability lanes, okay. and we take them to the rotability lanes. And the drivers are very cooperative. And we know when they get into that rotability lane, we need to get them the chassis fixed. And uh, either if it cannot be fixed immediately, something minor, then we're going to flip it and put it on a different chassis so that the tri driver can get out of the gate or whichever. Fair it enough. Is. How about you? Well, I think generally speaking, the federal law that was passed over 10 years ago now requires that the chassis be rotable in good working condition before the trucker hooks up to it. So if that were working, uh, there'd probably be a lot less problems at the gate and everywhere else. So bottom line is I don't think that the providers have yet gotten to the stage where the equipment is rotable, is safe before we get it. So there's major delays there. Uh, and secondarily, if you have the union interjecting itself after you've picked it up, second guessing either the equipment provider or the trucker who says this is rotable, you've got a major issue on time spent uh, trying to get in and out of the facility. Okay, well let's, well, let's back up just a, a minute here. We've got, we're talking about perhaps a 30 minute delay or a 60 minute delay in a uh, intermodal move that might have that box might have been in motion for 28 days coming from with a slow steaming vessel and coming through the canal and winding up uh, in one of the ports on the east coast let's um how if you're the customer how important is it to have to to have that 90 minute delay in a four-week movement well, you wouldn't think it was that important in terms of the time continuum, but what we found, particularly last year again with the congestion issue, that 90 minutes, and sometimes it's much longer than that, but that has generated massive demerge, detention, per diem bills that now flow to the owner of this product that's been held up for maybe only 90 minutes there. And those fees this past year, which are still being disputed, uh, run into the millions of dollars for a lot of shippers. So uh, all of a sudden, they not only are, because remember, it used to be there weren't any particular charges for that. It wasn't the equipment was handled differently. Now somebody fairly high up in the company is signing a, we'll pay $5 million for something that happened in Port of New York uh, for delays. That's not something they've had to deal with before. So the, it's been a painful education over the last year as to what's happening with the chassis, who owns it, and who ultimately pays for these kind of delays. So what, what how does this look from your perspective, Jim? Well, I, you know, I just think uh, you look at the process, particularly at a rail, if, if you, that I'm familiar with. You know, the truckers want to get out. They want to get out to their customer. Now, that's nice. But one of the things they got to do is really do a good inspection on that equipment before it leaves. Now, once they're out and they say, oh, I've got a problem with it, I hate to tell you this, but when they're coming in, they don't want to raise their hand and say, oh, I have this problem. You have to try to find the problem because, oh, I have a problem means you're going to pay for it because when you went out the gate, there was no problem. Now you're coming in the gate and it is an associated problem. So really on the end gate, now the railroad is really looking at the inspection a lot harder. But there's many times things don't get fixed and uh, you know it's part of that in and out gate process. No, I don't want to... Uh you know, dominate the conversation here with chassis talk. Uh, Dan, 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 do you have any questions for our esteemed colleagues here? Well, we did have a question come in that I would like to, to pose to both of you gentlemen. Um, and it's from Joe uh, Majira, who is president of Atlantic Star Trucking. And he wants to know when the chassis issues at the ports will get resolved. Um, we've talked about a lot of different issues here, obviously, but uh, could you maybe talk about your, what you see happening a year from now or five years from now, what, what, 
when will some of these issues finally be resolved? Well, there has been, let me actually first say, the railroad facilities are much better than the port facility. So a lot of what I'm referencing are not in the rail facilities. There are some problems there, but they are, they are marginally uh, compared to what goes on in the ports. Uh, I think we're certainly seeing some, some good uh, efforts uh, starting on the West Coast, which again have never been my particular favorite point of view, but the, the two ports in Southern California, their new leaders have been working very hard uh, to not only get the chassis pool up that they've had, but to handle a lot of the other issues that, that sort of go with that sort of huge size, new vessels and the rest. They're, they're trying different things. They're taking a far more proactive uh, role. I don't see that quite as successful on the East Coast uh, right now, but there are a lot of discussions, a lot of stakeholder groups. People understand uh, the issues that we're trying to deal with. But right now, quite frankly, what is holding up progress on the chassis on both coasts is the labor's role in both maintenance and repair and, uh, and inspection. And there is some activity now by the Federal Maritime Commission to ask the, the two groups, the, the bargaining unit for business and the union itself, uh, where do they get the claim jurisdiction to do this and how does all this play out? But I don't really see us going f too far afield in solving it until we first address that labor issue. Is it something that will be part of a labor agreement, you think? Well, it already is, but the people that negotiated it don't own the chassis. They have no legal right to say, here's what you're going to do with your equipment. I see. Uh, so, and they did it in both coasts. So we have to get over that, that huge uh, problem with what is the, the legal right to do what they're trying to do. OK. All right, well, thank you. Uh, We'll uh, have another program in the future on, on Port Drage, I'm sure. Uh, and you're, I think you're going to the intermodal meeting uh, next week, Rip? Yes. And um, more than likely, this will, will be a hot topic out there as well. In fact, uh, there are eight separate sessions about intermodal trucking yeah. uh, at the uh, Intermodal Expo, where, uh, by the way, Jim is going to be uh, kicking off the event with a uh, uh, comments at the opening session. Um, there are going to be something like 80 speakers at this uh, event. It's a major uh, convention of the intermodal business that has been going on now for a little more than three decades. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, and I think, uh, and I don't know if Jim would agree with me, but since I started going to these things in 1983 or 84, um, Intermodal has really come a huge way in terms of its acceptance by shippers, in terms of its dependability, uh, in terms of the quality of the equipment that's provided by the companies, and yes, the quality of the trucking service too. Now that I've given that little oration, right. what do you guys think? Right. The educational sessions are very good and uh, certainly the exhibition hall where you can uh, walk around there and see uh, new technology or you can see even uh, some of the newer equipment on the floor. Uh, it's, it's very beneficial. It's a great, uh, great program that uh, IANA puts on. Okay. On that note, uh, we are about out of time. Um, so thank you. I want to thank every, all, each one of our guests for taking time to join, join us in this conversation about multimodal transportation. Um, uh, a full replay of this program will be available on ttnews.com later today. And again, look for the September 21st issue of Transport Topics for a complete listing of the top 50 global freight carriers and additional coverage on this important topic. And once again, thank you to our sponsors for this program today, <clears throat> today, Rider and Auto Research Center. If you're viewing the program today and do not currently subscribe to Transport Topics, uh, please take advantage of a special offer on our website, liveonweb.ttnews.com slash subscribe. Uh, I'm told you'll get uh, 12 weeks free if you do that. Um, and if you like these coffee mugs that are on our desk, you can get one of those too, just by signing up to uh, uh, our fan club at, uh, again, liveonweb.ttnews.com slash fan club. Our next Live on Web program is October 28th, 
And that program will focus on the next generation of people, business, and technology in the trucking industry. So until then, thank you and goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.